um, uh, a difficult pain problem, uh, and we want to take it through, um, w you know, some definitions of it and how to prevent it, uh, how to manage it. So can I have the next uh, slide, please? And relevant issues are, as I mentioned, the definition of it, its significance in pain medicine, preventing and managing. Next slide, please. So there's um, a number of studies that have been done in terms of what is the incidence and the significance of post-herpetic uh, post neuralgia. And when you look at, these are some of the studies that have been done, and you look at the uh, ages of post-herpetic neuralgia, and then you look at the ages of those greater than 60, what, you'll, what you find is that patients over the age of 60 have a higher incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia. Uh, next slide, please. So this depicts uh, graphically what happens um, with uh, the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia with age. So as one gets older or up in um, uh, age, the uh, incidence of um, zoster, acute zoster, rises, as you can see, and the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia also parallels the rise in acute zoster. So this is a uh, problem of uh, the uh, older individual, and especially after the age of 60, it starts to rise uh, significantly. This uh, was uh, done in 1965. This was done 30 years later in 1995, and what you can see is the incidence of herpes zoster or shingles uh, is, the, you know, it, it uh, coincides with what was done 30 years ago. So the incidence remains the same after the age of 60. It starts to take off. Next, please. And uh, um, how do you uh, define post-herpetic neuralgia. So we looked at the incidence of acute zoster, and we looked at the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia uh, defined by age, but when do you go from acute to um, uh, acute zoster to post-herpetic neuralgia? Just one second. And um, here, this, uh, this is important because it shows you at one month what is the incidence of post-herpetic neuralgia at one month in patients who are old, um, uh, younger than 60 and older than 60. And you can see there's about a five-fold uh, difference in the incidence at one month. At three months, the incidence falls for both of them. So it's about a quarter. It's about... 25% of what it was at one month, the pain after shingles. At one year, it falls even further. It's a, it falls about uh, almost, uh, it's, it's about two-thirds in those over 60 and uh, about one-quarter in those under 60. So the significance of this, when you read articles about uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, you have to know how they define it. Because if they define it, and if you look at studies on how to manage and treat it, if you, if you define it at one month and you then follow the patients out over time for your treatment, you know that a significant number of patients in both age groups are going to drop just by the you know, natural course of the uh, uh, pain problem. It's going to, the disease is going to uh, decrease over time in any event. So that's why you have to make sure in, in, someone, uh, in studies that would say, we use this treatment for uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, you've got to make sure they have a cohort group that's equally matched and uh, with a placebo that's followed so you can see what happens uh, with the treatment group uh, compared to the placebo group to really make any significant statements because you give anybody anything for post-herpetic neuralgia, just a natural course of events, they're going to decrease their pain. So that's, a, that's an important concept for you to be aware of. Next, uh, please. Okay, so acute zoster. Uh, post-herpetic neuralgia starts with acute zoster. 
and uh, uh, usually acute zoster typically is, is self-limited. Uh, it lasts a couple of weeks, uh, 10 to 20 days usually. Uh, it presents uh, with pain, and usually the pain is prodromal to the rash. And uh, they can have perhaps some fever, malaise, and the, and the rash appears typically. Um, now, patients can have recurrence of zoster. Um, so there's a 5 to 6% incidence of recurrence, but it usually occurs uh, several years after the first event. It is possible that a, a subsequent uh, recurrence can uh, uh, happen, but it is, it is not that likely. Okay, next please. So we have acute zoster from the uh, breakout of the uh, rash until the vesicles uh, scab and the scabs fall off. That is considered the period of acute zoster lasting up to typically about three weeks uh, maximum, usually two weeks, and uh, then it resolves. As mentioned, uh, um, patients who have um, a prodrome of pain in a dermatomal or radicular uh, distribution uh, for about two to three days uh, before the rash it, it will typically occur. And then this is the events that occur with the zoster. You get vessels uh, stop forming after about three to five days after the initial breakout of the uh, vesicles. After the rash breaks out, the vesicles start to form. And so new vesicles uh, stop forming within about five days. And it starts to um, uh, postulate in six days and then scabbing within a week to ten days and complete healing in two to three to four weeks. So um, what some individuals have claimed or have uh, 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 promoted is a concept of zoster-associated pain. They look at zoster as a continuum from the acute outbreak through the development of the vesicles, the healing of the vesicles, and then going into the uh, post-acute uh, phase of zoster um, and into what could be determined by various definitions of uh, post-herpetic neuralgia. So they, uh, some have um, advocated that you have zoster-associated pain to describe all of zoster pain, and you describe where it is in relationship to the acute pain breakout, resolution of, of the rash and vesicles, and whether they are continuing to have pain afterwards. This zoster-associated pain is broken up, as I mentioned, acute pain and into post-herpetic neuralgia. You have your prodrome of pain a few days before, then the rash breaks out, and then the scabs fall off, and then patients can persist with pain after uh, the scabs fall off. And so rather than um, breaking it up into acute zoster and post-herpetic neuralgia, um, uh, some have advocated for this term uh, zoster-associated pain. So you need to be aware of that when you read articles about it in case you hear that. Okay, next please. So what can happen uh, with um, zoster? So what can happen, let's say patients go along and, they're, and, and they have their usual life uh, episodes of symptom distress and affecting their quality of life, lump, uh, 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 bumps in the curve in, in our living experience, and then they get the event of acute zoster, and then their pain increases. And so one of uh, a few things will happen. You can, this is just a way to visualize the effects of um, acute zoster into post-herpetic neuralgia. Rarely, rarely, uh, a zoster can cause death. If it disseminates and gets into the central nervous system and causes uh, meningitis or widespread zoster, uh, patient, there, there have been deaths associated with acute outbreak, but it's not very 
likely. It's very unusual. But death is a possibility. And so one possibility is that over time, as we saw in the other graphs, over time, the symptoms in the, uh, will resolve, the quality of life will improve, and patients will by and large get better uh, over time. Some patients will have persistent pain that never resolves and just continues on for in, indeterminately and sometimes for the rest of their life. And, and then there are those who are in between who peak and they get some resolution of their pain, but it never goes back to baseline. They never get full resolution of their pain. So this is just another way to look at what happens after a zoster episode and the possibilities that can occur in terms of response.